The Earth was once the center of the universe. It was flat. Then it was round. And it circled the sun. It was no longer the center of the universe. It was a tiny part of the Milky Way. The Milky Way was the only galaxy, except it wasn't. It was only one of billions of galaxies floating in space without end. Every single time we think we've got it all figured out, we realize we've merely found another piece of the picture. It is a big picture. With many pieces. Sir Isaac Newton was the first to state the law of gravity. Eventually, everybody agreed that gravity alone formed galaxies and stars and planets, and that gravity alone holds the universe together. Then we discovered a force a thousand billion, 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 billion times more powerful than gravity. Until recently, we believed that the space between the stars and planets was empty, a vacuum. We now know it is teeming with charged particles. see glowing electric filaments spanning millions of light years. We see stellar and galactic formations shaped by magnetic fields. Only electric currents create magnetic fields. It is possible that the predominant force in the universe is not gravity, but something else. Recent discoveries in space have amazed and perplexed astronomers. Current popular theories in the sciences can neither predict nor explain the phenomena we are now observing. A new theory is being proposed. A theory which can both predict and explain the data coming back from deep space. Its implications are profound and affect all the scientific disciplines. It is in fact a synthesis of the disciplines. A synthesis which has already led to discoveries that link modern astronomy, leading edge plasma physics and ancient mythology. The electric model offers us a new interpretation of the workings of the universe, the history of our solar system, and even human history.
The rise of science was a triumph over mythology, over magic and superstition. That's why the word science today implies reliability. The word myth means fiction, not true. And it turns out that the key to understanding the myths is the same key that is now helping us to understand objects in deep space. To understand the workings of the physical universe. That key is electricity. It was 33 years ago that I first began to wonder about these preposterous stories told around the world, what we call world mythology. What was it that provoked this incredible outpouring of human imagination? just a few thousand years ago, just before the birth of the first civilization. I came to a radical conclusion that the myths arose from extraordinary natural events. Our early ancestors witnessed things in the sky that are not seen today. The events were awe-inspiring, both beautiful and terrifying. So it shouldn't surprise us that the myths are so incomprehensible. Well, of course they're incomprehensible. The, the celestial references are no longer present. It was in 1994 that I was invited to come to the US to attend a conference which was dealing with the possibility that the ancient sky, as witnessed by our earliest forebears, was different to the one we see today. I'd been interested in this uh, kind of idea because uh, it could only be explained in terms of electromagnetic influences within the solar system. So it came as a bit of a shock and a surprise to see David Talbot showing slides at one of the uh, sessions at the conference, which I recognized immediately as being similar to those of electric discharges in the laboratory. wonderful for me personally to uh, come to my first Cronia meeting and hear Dave Talbot and I still want to see some of those slides that he showed again and again and again that explained the, the white crown of Egypt and the rest of these uh, things that he showed us all from mythology all from thousands of years ago these things clearly were seen by civilizations that never talked to each other from the far corners of the earth all just clicked together like a like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle in my mind. A breakthrough for me came when I realized that many different cultures spread around the world use different words, different symbols, different myths to describe precisely the same formations in the sky. The Ouroboros, or celestial serpent biting its tail, for example, occurs on every habitable continent, but it has no ties to the world we now observe. Like all of the archetypes, it is part of an alien sky. A cosmic column rising to the center of the sky, holding aloft the wheel of heaven and much more than a wheel because this was the revolving cosmic temple, the city of the gods, the kingdom of heaven, always resting on the cosmic column. Then there's the image of the four rivers or pathways radiating from the center of the sky out to the boundary, the rim of the wheel. The simplest forms lead you invariably to the full story of world mythology. The hero's journey unfolds as the story of the wheel's axle. The mother goddess finds her identity in the star at the summit, the hub and spokes of the wheel. From childhood on, I've always had uh, a deep interest in mythology, mythology, and I remember that as a child I was trying to draw up uh, genealogies 
of the gods as provided in Greek mythology and I, I soon found out that it didn't work, nor did anything else in mythology seem to work. There was no singular fitting explanation that would make sense of these stories. So I basically laid this whole subject to rest and I didn't look at it for many years. Until I came across the work um, by Dave Talbot and, uh, and Everett Cochran mainly, whose, whose articles were real eye-openers for me. And as soon as I began to read these articles, it became clear to me that we were really looking here at a very important key to the unlocking of myth. And the, the recent findings uh, provided by plasma physics are capable of providing that key. Um, based on the results we have seen so far in Dr. Perret's investigations um, with petroglyphs, which he matched successfully to laboratory experiments involving plasma, it has now become crystal clear and I think undeniable that um, the, the morphology of plasma as, as it manifests itself, both in the laboratory and in space, can account successfully for the major themes in, in, in mythology. To find the true meaning of the myths, we follow a forensic approach. The purpose is to expose the points of agreement between the different cultures. Because here at the level of the archetypes, everything is unified. There are no isolated themes of myth at the level of the substructure. This is like a holograph. Follow one archetype and its links to other archetypes, and you will find one story told around the world. Throughout almost all of history, we have regarded the states of matter as being solid, liquid or gas. But in the last century or so, we have found that there is a form of matter where the charged particles within atoms are separated to some degree or another, and that is known as a plasma. It is the fundamental state of matter. It was not until the second half of the 20th century that we came to realize the role of plasma in the universe. And this has changed the picture of space completely. Not long ago, we thought of the physical universe as being constituted fundamentally of nothing more than atoms and empty space. But a plasma includes at least a percentage of charged particles, protons and electrons, that are not bound to any atomic structure. And plasma is an excellent conductor. Electrons will move efficiently in the direction of charge equalization, and that's an electric current, of course. Now, the reason why we see magnetic fields everywhere we look in space is because electric currents produce magnetic fields, and only electric currents produce magnetic fields. But astronomers working only with gravitational equations did not anticipate the discovery of pervasive magnetic fields in deep space. Electric currents also account for the abundant filamentation of space plasma. First the electric currents produce the magnetic fields, then these fields confine the electron flow to narrow paths. Such current paths or filaments are called Birkeland currents, named after the pioneer Christian Birkeland. They are typically braided just like the twisted wires of transmission lines on Earth. Well, that's their role in space, to conduct electricity across vast distances, creating the astonishing structures we observe in every direction. None of these structures were anticipated by gravitational theory, and none are indicated by the behavior of neutral gases in a vacuum. In any theory of the universe, plasma is extremely important because it has been found since the space age that it makes up 99.99% of the visible universe. So our inexperience with it on the Earth's surface is rather uh, crippling when it comes to trying to decide on a cosmology to explain the visible universe. Now, plasma behaves uh, rather oddly compared to uh, normal matter, the matter we find, the solids, liquids and gases on Earth. 
If you look at a novelty uh, plasma ball, you will see that it forms these bright filaments that dart all around inside the globe. And if you look closely at them, you'll see that they're actually twin filaments twisted together. In other words, nature finds it efficient to be able to transfer energy over a distance by twisting two pairs of filaments together. And this is a characteristic of the way plasma carries electric currents in space. And one of the puzzles that has faced astronomers since the space age is the discovery of filamentary uh, structures in galaxies, around stars, even the cometary tails of uh, planets and comets themselves. These filamentary structures have come as a surprise. We now have plasma physicists who are doing important experiments in laboratories around the world. And one of the virtues of plasma experiments is that they can be scaled over an enormous number of magnitudes. In other words, uh, a discharge phenomenon that may be seen in the laboratory that occupies only a few centimetres can be scaled up to the size of a galaxy and you will see the same structures. Now this introduces a new area into cosmology where we can do experiments on Earth which can verify our ideas, our theories about how the rest of the universe works. Some of the natural consequences of electrocosmology are the, uh, the patterns that we see, both in the laboratory and in the sky. Uh, a, a very good example of this is the work of uh, Dr. Anthony Peratt, who was a graduate student of the very famous uh, Hannes Alfian, who was really the father of uh, electric cosmology. Peratt simulated on a supercomputer using just a cloud of electrical charges and a magnetic field just using the laws of electrical science, not using anything to do with gravity. He simulated what looked like a spiral galaxy. And the interesting thing is that Peratt's spiral galaxy in the laboratory had exactly the same rotational properties as the real spiral galaxies that we see in the sky do. Plasma was named by Irving Langmuir because of its lifelike qualities. In other words, the similarity to blood plasma gave rise to the term plasma now used in the sciences. Well, this has incredible meaning for us because of the nature of the metamorphosing. The god who is now an eagle, now a serpent or dragon, now a leonine figure with long flowing hair. figures take on a whole new meaning when we can interpret them with the benefit of plasma science. The new instrumentation that was developed in the space age expanded our ability to perceive things, perceive facts. We could now see things in the entire electromagnetic spectrum instead of just the narrow sliver of visible light. You can see it, the actual moment of deploy there when we take the switch to deploy and it's so quiet. And we had so sensors that were out in space. We were freed from the geocentric and anthropocentric order that had prevailed before. got a whole new universe and the theoreticians are still trying to look at it through, uh, a friend of mine says they're peering through the wrong end of the telescope and trying and telling us what they imagine they see. Modern cosmology gives us a rather disconnected view of the universe. In other words, we are separated star from star by vast distances. Light takes a long time to travel between stars and across galaxies and therefore we look upon ourselves as isolated and disconnected. The electric universe takes a different view. It says that we are a 
part of the sun's environment, electrical environment, and the sun is a part of the galactic environment, and the galaxy itself is strung, like all galaxies, on huge electric currents flowing through the universe. One of the typical questions that uh, plasma cosmologists hear all the time is, how do you know what's out there in space? How do you know there's electricity out there in space? Uh, is there energy out there in space? Why should we consider anything more than gravity? And the answer is that through the years, we've used optical telescopes, but recently we have what are, what are called radio telescopes, and we've broadened the spectrum that we can look at the sky with. And those radio telescopes can measure electric currents and magnetic fields and we can we can determine from those measurements the strength of the electric currents the strength of the forces involved and the amount of energy that's stored out there in space the two major pillars of modern cosmology are based on the theories of relativity and quantum theory and yet as einstein himself noted the two are incompatible and that may be because the theories of relativity deal with matter as if its only uh, consequence is the bending of space. The electric universe, on the other hand, deals with the electrical structure of matter at the subatomic level and then works its way up through uh, living systems, if you like, planets, stars, galaxies, and the entire universe and shows that it is the electrical structure of matter that forms the amazing shapes we see in deep space. We can demonstrate the existence of these currents flowing between galaxies and between stars by the presence of the magnetic fields they generate. Magnetic fields are threaded through space at all dimensions uh, within the solar system on the surface of the sun, between stars, and within galaxies, and even between galaxies. Now, a magnetic field can only be generated by electric currents. So, in other words, to continue that magnetic field for any length of time requires that there be electrical power input into those magnetic fields. And that raises the whole question of where does this power come from? Modern cosmology is uh, highly mathematical. In fact, we were joking before that about the idea that the only people who understand cosmology are professional cosmologists. Uh, the, the basis of cosmology, really, if you, if you hunt for it, is, lies in Einsteinian relativistic mechanics. And when Einstein promulgated his ideas, he totally and completely ignored anything electrical. And so the modern cosmology, with all of its ideas of omega and expanding universe and inflation theory and the Big Bang and all the rest of it, are predicated on a foundation which ignores almost half of man's knowledge about the way the universe works, which is electricity. It may sound like uh, I'm dismissing Einstein and his theories of relativity out of hand, but we have to give Einstein credit for his integrity in pointing out that his theory did not meet his requirements and that is that it, his theory had to be tied back to some form of reality and there is no explanation as to why matter should curve space to give the effect of gravity he felt that quantum theory being uh, a probabilistic theory divorced uh, cause and effect and this is one of the things you cannot do in physics is divorce cause and effect otherwise you might as well give up and get a real job but this is a puzzle that dogged Einstein through his later years to the point that his followers tended to go off and use his geometrical explanations to conjure up things like black holes and uh, neutron stars and so on and the expansion of the universe and the Big Bang without referring back to Einstein, who with great integrity, said he wasn't satisfied with his explanation. One of the problems faced by astronomers uh, after the space age began was to explain the discovery of very concentrated outbursts of energy in deep space. And that meant 
for them, since gravity is the only driving force available to them, that they required an infinite concentration of mass because gravity is an infinitely weak force. The black hole, as Wheeler originally visualized it, sucked everything, including light, in. And so therefore it was invisible. So he could postulate its existence and we couldn't see it. And because we couldn't see it, we couldn't prove that it wasn't there. Later on, in order to explain these fantastic emissions of energy from, uh, from galaxies, uh, it, uh, it was proposed, and I believe it was Stephen Hawking who did it, that there were various types of black holes, some of which actually then spat matter back out again in jets because, why? Because we had observed jets. In the electrical model, it's quite simple. If you think about it, the power that's expressed in your own home, in the heaters and the electric motors and the lighting and so on, is actually generated at a vast distance away from your house. In deep space, the same thing is true. The energy which we see concentrated in these events which are attributed to black holes and so on, can more easily be explained as the confluence of electric energy from different parts of the same galaxy or even from other parts of the universe. And it is this explosive release of energy which forms the vast jets that we see lit up and exploding from the centers of active galaxies. We also have observed double radio sources either side of galaxies. And that event was predicted by Hannes Alfian, the founding father of modern electrical cosmology, and is still to this day unexplained by standard cosmology. One of the most interesting phenomena in the sky is the so-called pulsar. A pulsar is a, uh, an object uh, that is observed to put out pulses, both of light and radio uh, activity, RF, uh, in the RF spectrum. And those pulses are extremely rapid. Um, they, they are something like milliseconds apart. So it's like a extremely fast strobe light and thinking of a, of a strobe light, uh, astronomers immediately leapt to the lighthouse kind of analogy. Something that must be spinning around, a beam is going around, and it's going around so quickly that this thing goes flash, flash, flash. Well, once the, the repetition rate of the pulsars was observed to get up to in the millisecond range, that meant that this star that was putting out this beam of radiation would have had to be rotating at 300 times a second. And 300 times a second, we're talking about the speed of a dentist drill. So the astronomers decided, well, normal stars couldn't possibly rotate at that speed. And so they postulated the existence of what they called a neutron star. A neutron star is, is a star that is so dense that it holds together so well that it can indeed rotate at the speed of a dentist's drill. Well, the problem is that in, in nuclear chemistry, we know that you can't pack neutrons together uh, that densely. They will all fly apart instantaneously. There's a thing, a principle called the island of stability in nuclear chemistry that absolutely prevents that. So here we, again, we have uh, the standard astronomers or astrophysicists going directly against another well-developed science. In the electrical model, however, there's a very simple explanation for pulsars. Uh, everybody is familiar with the idea that uh, pulses can travel back and forth on electrical transmission lines. Uh, such uncontrolled pulses, for example, were responsible for the famous Northeast blackouts. A similar effect can, can occur between two binary stars connected by a plasma. The two binary stars act like capacitors that store charge and if you reduce that in size to something you can produce in the laboratory, you can produce it in the laboratory, and it's called a relaxation oscillator. And electrical engineers use it and have used it for decades. The idea of producing pulses every few milliseconds is a, is a sophomore level uh, experiment in an electrical engineering laboratory. It doesn't require neutronium, strange matter, or any other fictitious device. All it requires is 
two capacitors, a battery, and a, and a nonlinear resistor. And we maintain that that's exactly what a binary pair of stars connected by a plasma field uh, presents. A typical ion in the solar wind, a uh, hydrogen nucleus, moving about 20 kilometers per second, which is relatively slow for the ions in the solar wind, in the magnetic field of the sun, experiences potentially magnetic forces that are something like 10 million times the strength of the gravitational force on that same ion from the sun. An interesting demonstration that illustrates very readily the relative strength of magnetic force and gravitational force is the simple idea of a ball bearing sitting on a, on a wooden table. Uh, the entire mass of the Earth is pulling downward on that little ball bearing, and that's what prevents it from flying out into space. But a child can come along with a little horseshoe magnet and click, pick that ball bearing up instantly. The space age presents us with an interesting paradox. The technology of science is really quite extraordinary. And technology has taken us out into space, taken us to the moon, taken probes to distant planets, opened up whole new vistas in remote space with new telescopes and new ways of measuring what's happening in space. But the picture of theoretical science is much different. And many decades ago, assumptions began to crystallize in the theoretical sciences, beginning at the top, the, the queen of the sciences, as we say, which is cosmology. These theoretical assumptions have constrained all of the other theoretical sciences. Cosmology deals with the big picture questions, the first questions. How did the universe begin? What is it made of? How will it end? And so many popular uh, theoretical constructs, from the Big Bang to string theory to dark matter and black holes, the formation of stars, formation of galaxies, all have arisen from assumptions first postulated by cosmologists. At the same time, these assumptions have defined boundaries for other theoretical sciences, working down from astronomy and astrophysics to the space sciences, solar, solar theory, even Earth history, even human history, have all been confined by these boundaries established by the queen of the sciences, cosmology. <laughs> The sun just dominates our sky as the source of light and warmth and life itself on Earth. And this preeminence of the sun is so clear and obvious that it remains a mystery why virtually every ancient culture insisted that before the present sun, there was a quite different luminary ruling the sky, the central sun, the superior sun, the best sun, the motionless sun. And all of these cultures, whatever may be the meaning of these traditions, are insisting that the sky has changed. Of course, our ideas about the sun have continually changed. Only a few centuries ago, the sun was a campfire or ember in the sky. Then early in the 20th century, under the influence of gravitational theory, the sun was seen as a gravitationally collapsing nebular cloud. In the atomic age, astronomers began to visualize the sun in terms of a nuclear furnace hidden at its core. But now we're in the age of plasma science, with discoveries of the electric currents in space. And it's inconceivable that these discoveries would not change the picture of the sun again. Plasma cosmologists have been able to demonstrate experimentally and also in the supercomputer that galaxies are an electrical phenomenon, which raises the question about stars, and in particular our own sun, which is the closest star to the Earth, of course. Any theory of the sun has to explain how it could continue to burn for billions of years and also explain its present size.
based on its known mass. And of course, as soon as nuclear energy was discovered, it was uh, grasped immediately as the energy source of the sun. But all of that assumes that the sun is disconnected and an isolated body, and that it must consume itself over its lifetime to provide the heat and light that we receive from it. But if the sun is connected to the rest of the galaxy in an electrical sense, it doesn't require to burn itself at all. And the energy that we receive is actually being received from the galaxy, and the sun is acting as a focus for that energy. The sun is actually a fairly typical star. And so if we want to understand stars and cosmology, we really have to understand the sun. And the standard model of the sun, so-called, that astronomers are so very proud of these days, really doesn't explain very much about the sun. Why is there a corona in the first place? Everybody knows about the corona, the beautiful corona that we see during solar eclipses. Why is it there? It's clearly an electrical phenomenon. One of the greatest puzzles about the sun has been with a surface temperature of 6,000 degrees, high above that surface we have temperatures of millions of degrees. And the question has been how do we get the energy from the centre of the sun somehow past that surface to heat the upper atmosphere of the sun to millions of degrees. In the electric model you don't have that problem because if the energy is arriving from outside the sun, the first place you expect to see that energy expressed is above the sun in its tenuous atmosphere. And that is the place where particle acceleration occurs and the apparent temperature goes very high indeed, up into the millions of degrees. The fact that the particles in the solar wind accelerate, that is to say, increase their velocity with increasing distance away from the sun, the farther away they get, the faster they go. And the fact that those particles are indeed charged particles leads me, as an electrical engineer, to come to the immediate conclusion that this is an electrical process. In the solar model, uh, think of the sun as being a positive anode, very high voltage body that obviously would, would emanate an electric field. And if you put a charged particle in an electric field, it will accelerate. That's the way we accelerate particles here on Earth. It's the way every physicist and electrodynamicist has ever increased the velocity of a charged particle is put in an electric field. One of the features we observe on the sun which have no business being there according to the standard model are sunspots. The most significant thing about a sunspot is the fact that the center of the sunspot is dark and if the sun is trying to radiate energy from its core into space we should expect that it is bright. And if you think about that umbra, that darkest place in the center of sunspots, that's the place where we can see deepest into the sun. And just consider the fact that at that point where we can really see down into the sun, that's the absolute coldest place that we are able to measure. If the center of the sun is really a nuclear fusion furnace, it should be the hottest because we're closest to the source and it's not the case. If you ask any astronomer why are there sunspots, why are the umbra dark, they will blame it on some sort of warped, twisted magnetic fields. Uh, they will say that it has to do with the solar dynamo, all of which lurk unseen like a big genie somewhere below the surface. These phenomena are only to be expected if the sun is electrical in nature. Astrophysicists make the claim that the solar fusion model has indeed been tested in the laboratory. And nothing really is further from the truth. Although each of the steps involved in the hydrogen to helium fusion reaction have indeed been verified experimentally, 
the overall experiment, the overall reaction, has never been produced in a continuous laboratory experiment. Continuous hydrogen to helium fusion has not been attained in the lab. The strength, in fact, of the electric cosmology is that, indeed, all of the, uh, the mechanisms that the electrical uh, people talk about have indeed been verified over decades, in fact, at least a century, in the laboratory. The plasma uh, scaling is well known, and, and plasma and electrical experiments have, have verified every step of the way. There are a number of observations that are, uh, have ad hoc present explanations but really have no explanation in the, in the standard model and are natural consequences of the electrical model. Uh, for example, uh, heavy elements, the solar spectrum, the neutrino deficiency, the neutrino variability, solar atmosphere, differential rotation by latitude, differential rotation by depth, equatorial plasma torus, sunspots, sunspot migration, the sunspot penumbra, and the sunspot cycle itself. Magnetic field strength, the even magnetic field, helioseismology, the solar density, and the changing size. All of the um, observations that in that list are natural consequences of the electrical sun model. Standard astronomers tend to uh, pass them off as being inconsequential difficulties that will eventually someday be solved. I maintain, and so do our colleagues here, that these are not inconsequential, but are rather death blows to the solar uh, uh, fusion model because they are important. They're not secondary. They're primary falsifying observations for that failed nuclear fusion model. What I find so fascinating about the electric model of the sun is not just that it's a challenge to long-standing theory, but that it opens the door to the ancient world, to an electric sky. The electromagnetic phenomena that we now observe on the surface of the sun and in the vicinity of the sun are direct pointers backwards to the plasma formations that were seen above the ancient sky worshippers. Electrical currents in space can either be invisible or they can be visible. If they're very diffuse, in other words, there's very little energy per cubic meter, they will be invisible. But where that energy becomes concentrated, it will begin to glow. And we see this kind of thing in the ion tails of comets, for instance. Where the energy becomes very concentrated, we begin to see arcs and sparks, if you like electrical discharge phenomena. The standard theory of comets comes from the view that the solar system was formed from a rotating cloud of gas and dust and that the planets in some fashion as yet unexplained completely uh, formed uh, from most of that gas and dust but there were leftovers and the leftovers are beyond sight outside the solar system in a hypothetical Oort cloud, as it's called. We have no observational evidence for such a cloud. The electric universe model of comets is that they are actually parts of well-differentiated planetary bodies that have in the past suffered from electrical plasma discharge machining and that some of the surface material has been lofted into space, so it is expected to be rocky. The second thing is that because comets uh, trace a elongated orbit, both away from the sun and towards the sun, in that trajectory its charge changes, its voltage changes. Since it spends most of its time in the outer solar system, the voltage that it has reflects the voltage in the outer solar system. But as it hurtles towards the sun, as it enters towards the Earth's orbit, the 
voltage is changing rapidly and the comet has to respond to that by beginning to discharge. And that's where we see the familiar cometary phenomena of the coma and the various tails that it uh, produces. This creates a very distinct difference between the two models, the standard model of a comet, which is supposed to be uh, dust and ice left over from the formation of the solar system, and the electrical model, which says that a comet is an electrical uh, body, which begins to discharge as it enters the inner solar system. Ever since we've begun to look at comets in close-up, and Halley was the first one that was observed by several spacecraft, close up. It was found to astronomers surprise that the material coming off the comet was coming in discrete jets and seemed to be coming from what looked like circular areas on the crater. But the imagery wasn't sufficiently sharp to be able to tell exactly what was going on. This required the standard model to come up with an idea that maybe the surface of the comet is coated in black tarry substance or something which was preventing the material from just evaporating uh, from the surface and uh, forming jets as it burst through the surface. But when later images were looked at as we passed other comets, it was found to astronomers' amazement that uh, they were seeing very sharp relief. It wasn't like a melted ice cream. It was looking like a piece of uh, heavily cratered rock. Now this fits the electric model of the electrical discharge birth of such a body. In other words, there's very little distinction between an asteroid and a comet other than its orbit. It was in this context that we, I looked at uh, Comet Temple 1, which was uh, chosen as the target for an impact. And the idea was that the impact would create a, a small crater which could then be photographed by the passing spacecraft and we could determine whether the material was uh, ice or dust or rock. Uh, based on the size of the impact crater. It seemed to me that if this comet was a charged body, there would be several other effects that were unexpected. Principally, as a, a metal copper object approached the comet, there should be an electric discharge to that copper projectile. In other words, there would be an initial flash, and then there would be the impact itself. And the impact I suggested would be far more energetic than was expected because it would tend to concentrate the electrical discharge in the area of the impact. And also it may change the nature of the jets nearby. So it was uh, with great interest that I awaited the results of the impact and watched it on television. Before the impact, the astronomers in the uh, assembled control room were worried that they wouldn't see anything, that the impact would uh, result in a very small puff of dust and that would be the end of it. So when the impact occurred, they were surprised by two things. One was that there was an initial flash followed by the main impact, which was so energetic that some of the sensors were almost swamped and the passing spacecraft was unable to achieve its primary aim, which was to photograph the crater. Part of the surprising brightness of the dust released from the impact with Comet Temple 1 was due to the fact that it was so intense and so widespread. And one of the initial findings was that uh, it seems to be very finely divided dust. Now this is the same thing that was found at Comet Halley uh, and it was a surprise then, so it's rather surprising that they are surprised once more. The point is that an electrical discharge on the surface will release material, dusty material, very finely divided. It's a technique that's used in uh, sputtering of metals onto, uh, for instance, uh, astronomical mirrors. So this production of very fine dust is to be expected in the electrical model. But in the standard model, you are asking ices to evaporate or to sublimate and in doing so to drive off pre-existing dust grains. So there's no way that the dust can be finely divided. It will be in its pristine state. So the production of this great cloud of very fine dust is rather inexplicable in the standard model. The electrical model of comets was driven for several people 
by Velikovsky's challenge that the solar system had electromagnetic forces to be taken into account. And one of the early pioneers in uh, addressing this issue of uh, comets and electrical phenomenon was Ralph Jurgens. When he proposed the electrical model of the sun, it implied that all bodies in the solar system must have, to some degree, a cometary uh, appearance or a cometary effect associated with them. Ralph Jurgens, in his model of the sun, showed that uh, bodies moving radially towards or away from the sun would experience electrical forces which could induce a cometary display, that is a visible display. Also working uh, in later years with Ralph Jurgens was Dr. Earl Milton, and he made some predictions and statements about the impact of Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 fragments with Jupiter. And his view of the electrical nature of those impacts was also vindicated. In the electrical model of the solar system, anybody moving away from or towards the sun at any great rate, for example like a comet, will experience electrical effects which result in a cometary appearance, and that could apply to a planet. Now Velikovsky, in his research, found that Venus was described as a stupendous comet at some point in ancient times. So it was very gratifying for him to be able to announce at the conference in 1974 that astronomers had discovered what they called a cometary tail of Venus. Some years later it was announced that it was discovered that stringy things were coming from Venus. And of course this was confirmation to the electrical model because plasma currents flow in strings. This discovery of a cometary aspect of Venus raises the issue of the intense heat we find on Venus. That intense heat is not well explained at all by any idea that the planet is somehow a twin of the Earth's. It raises the distinct possibility that Venus has had a far more dynamic history than we've been taught. Our ancient ancestors were obsessed with the comet. Let the slightest wisp of a comet appear in the sky and all of humanity was thrown into terror. But why was this? catastrophe that inspired the ancient words and phrases for the comet. The comet was the torch of the sky, the sword hanging over the world, the spiraling serpent or dragon, the spiraling sidelock or ribbon. The angrier lamenting goddess soaring across the sky, her hair disordered and blowing in the wind. Anyone exploring the roots of the ancient comet fears is going to run into the work of Emanuel Velikovsky, the controversial theorist who suggested that, well, there's a reason for the fears of comets around the world. We experienced this horrific cometary catastrophe. The world was devastated by a comet just a few thousand years ago. And Velikovsky went further. He said that not that long ago, planets appeared in the sky with comet-like attributes. In particular, he named the planet Venus as the great comet of antiquity. Both Wal Thornhill and I disagreed with many components of Velikovsky's reconstruction, but we also felt that Velikovsky had nailed certain principles that can help us to understand the early cultures. In particular, Velikovsky was correct in naming the planet Venus as the Great Comet. 
and the cometary language of Venus goes far beyond anything that Velikovsky himself published. In every corner of the world, the language of the comet and the language of Venus are identical. Venus as serpent or dragon. Venus as torch of the sky. Venus as long-haired star. Venus as bearded star. The Sumerian goddess Inanna was identified as Venus. She was the lady of life. But in her terrible aspect, she became a dragon-like flame in the sky. The texts say, like a dragon, you have deposited venom on the land, raining the fanned fire down upon the nation. Inanna became a roaring storm. She devastated the land. Mankind comes before you in fear and trembling at your tempestuous radiance, the texts say. Inanna's Babylonian counterpart, Ishtar, was also identified as Venus. She was the shining torch of heaven and earth. Furious and irresistible onslaught. I rain down like flames, the goddess announces. The Egyptian goddess Sekhmet has the same attributes. She takes the form of the fiery Uraeus serpent. She becomes a flame of fire in her tempest. A star scattering its flame and fire. Sekhmet herself says, the fear of me is in their hearts, and the awe of me is in their hearts. No one at all can approach her, the coffin texts say. The streams behind her are flames of fire. The astonishing fact is that goddesses everywhere exhibit this terrifying and cometary aspect. The Canaanite Anat, the Hindu Kali and Durga, the Greek Aphrodite, Athena, Medusa, and countless others. And of course you can add numerous counterparts in the New World, from the Incan goddess Chaska to the Aztec goddess Shokiquetzal to the legendary Nokomis of North American Indian tribes. The serpent or dragon is an unexplained mythical archetype. There's nothing like it anywhere in the biological world. And yet the same recurring features will be found in cultures the world over. The dragon's disheveled hair and shaggy beard. Its knotted aspect and its worldwide appearance as entwined twins. Its fiery or lightning-like emanations and its effusive feathers. In all of the ancient serpent or dragon images, it's the luminous, filamentary, braided, spiraling, metamorphosing, and destructive aspects that stand out. The very traits of high energy plasma discharge. The attributes of these mythic monsters remain unexplained only until we see the hairy and feathery attributes of the electric arc in the laboratory. We see precisely the same thing in enhanced images of the comet's tail. And we see the same thing in the comet-like discharges of distant nebulas. Gases in a vacuum don't behave this way, but electrified plasma does.
The recent discoveries about the comet have astonished astronomers. Extreme ultraviolet light, X-rays, supersonic jets, sharply etched surface relief, and cometary nuclei fragmenting explosively. No one expected such high-energy events. The electric model proposes that the comet is a charged object moving through an electric field. This would explain these phenomena. But what is creating the electric field? Suddenly everything changes. And we are talking about an electric sun, electric stars, an electric cosmology, and a whole new way of looking at how the universe works. <laughs>